Good afternoon, I'm Phil Owen, a peer recovery coach for Communities for Recovery and the Targeted Response Team. Today, my very special guest is Dr. Carlos Torado. Good afternoon, Dr. Torado. Hey, Phil, how you doing? I'm hanging in there, I'm doing just fine. You know, I probably the same isolation fatigue that everybody else is experiencing, but I'm trying to upspin everything and look at the light that's gonna come out of this at the end. Sure, absolutely, I think that's, uh, a healthy approach. Good. Well, could you give our audience a little bit of your background, please? Sure. Uh, I'm an addiction psychiatrist. Um, I, um, have, um, I have specialized training in uh, addiction psychiatry and medicine. Um, spent the first part of my career in uh, uh, academic medicine at uh, the University of Pennsylvania and UT Southwestern uh, Medical Center have uh, lived and work, worked in Austin since 2011. Um, over the last four years, I've uh, branched out into my own practice and have developed uh, various um, um, practice in, uh, practices, I guess, um, in um, um, primary care and, and psychiatry integration for substance use disorder and co-occurring disorders. Um, um, I'm the founder of a, of, a, of a group practice called Karma Health. Um, it's, it's an acronym. It stands for Collaborative Addiction Recovery Management and Assistance. And I also um, run a, 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 an integrated pain management program uh, called uh, Restore FX. We uh, specialize in um, behavioral rehabilitation and functional rehabilitation approaches for chronic pain. So. Most of my work has been squarely in the uh, area of uh, substance use disorders, uh, program development and implementation, chronic pain management, and, um, and, and some exciting areas over the last few years in terms of um, um, video and um, um, telephonic uh, peer recovery support, uh, prescription digital therapeutics, and um, 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 neurostimulation devices uh, for the treatment of opioid withdrawal. Great. So when we're talking about telesupports, fortunately, you've been working in an area that was just ahead of the curve because as we record this episode, we're amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, it's, certainly those uh, telesupports have become handy since we've all been isolated and, uh, and you know stuck in our confines, if you will. So when we're talking about telesupport, I believe what I understand now is that Medicare and Medicaid are paying for telemed, and that was something that wasn't going on prior? Well, CMS uh, issued guidance uh, in, the, in the midst of the public health emergency that's been declared uh, uh, as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic, allowing you know, for uh, reimbursement of uh, telemedical uh, services. Um, you know, this public health emergency declaration, um, you know, essentially creates a, a, an, an open uh, market, if you will, for the proliferation of uh, virtual, uh, you know, and, uh, telemedical applications. Um, I think that, um, you know, it, it remains to be seen um, how these um, um, relaxations of of, uh, of regulations around the delivery of telemedicine will uh, change uh, in, in the ad, you know in, in the wake of uh, of, um, um, of you know essentially closing the you know the public health emergency declarations but as far as I can tell um, w this is going to be the new normal for a while you know um, we certainly have um, pu a push um, for um, uh, reopening of the economy, et cetera. Uh, but at the same time, the need to de uh, develop uh, and deliver uh, virtual services, um, uh, especially in behavioral health, has never been more uh, pressing. And um, I think we're going to see um, uh, a lot of, of um, durable uh, innovations and openness to uh, reimbursement uh, for uh, especially behavioral health services moving forward. So uh, hopefully we see some of these advantages 
as we as we move out of COVID-19 at some point, um, you know, so if you could look into the future, if you will, and and have an idea of what, will there be a new normal or will we go back to the old normal? Will we see a hybrid in services? Are we gonna see a change in services? What, what do you expect? You know, I, I think the, 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 the long story short for that, I think will be, you know, largely predicated on reimbursement, right? Um, you know, the, the reimbursement is going to drive behavior likely more than anything. Now, you know, even as we speak, there's a lived experience uh, of, of virtual uh, healthcare delivery happening right now. Um, it's being measured, uh, not only from the perspective of implementation, but also uh, quality, uh, patient satisfaction, and uh, harder to get at outcomes, right? Um, there's a lot of factors kind of confounding, uh, you know, our ability to be able to determine what the true impact of widespread conversion to telemedicine it will have on outcomes. Um, now, now, one area that I think, <clears throat> it, it, you know, is um, potentially the new normal will be in behavioral health. I, I think that we already have so much um, obvious capability to deliver uh, behavioral health services. Like I, as a psychiatrist, for instance, don't rely on, on many physical findings, you know, in my interactions with patients more or less what I do is, is can be done very effectively via this medium, as can certain types of counseling, individual psychotherapy. In fact, some of it can even be augmented, you know, you know, you, for instance, via, via this platform, I don't want to get into a product endorsement, but you can, you can share your screen, uh, you can uh, present data um, that you can discuss in real time. So there's a lot of, of potential here for integrating feedback, integrating dashboards, integrating um, um, other, other uh, um, supports, for instance, right? Yeah. Um, conferencing in uh, uh, primary uh, caregivers, et cetera. So there's a lot of, of potential in the realm of behavioral health, care management, care planning that, um, that, um, that, that really for the first time has an opportunity to uh, uh, be implemented on a wider scale uh, and, you know, associated with that, the opportunity to actually collect data on its, on its true impact. Right. I think at Communities for Recovery with our peer-based services, you know, we're seeing engagement for those who want to engage at an increased level. In other words, we are having, we are becoming more efficient through some of the new platforms, even though we've been using telesupport for our individuals for quite some time. Um, now the ones that are on the fence about engagement, we're seeing numbers fall off a bit, but you know, I kind of um, maybe attribute that to some of what we're coining as isolation fatigue or COVID-19 fatigue of, of just, I'm done with it. I don't want to look at my laptop. I just, you know, mm -hmm. I need, I need mm -hmm. some action and that sort of thing. So I think, I think that that's interesting. I think obviously there's going to be some negative throughout this all, especially as it goes on. And, but we will be able to bring a lot of positives out of it as well. The one thing I notice is the group of individuals I work with, and you've been to the Austin area opioid work group where we focus mostly on opioid use disorders. And I think of how we have an opioid epidemic that is still going on and all of our focus is hyper-focused on this COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm, I'm wondering about services for opioid use disorder. And it seems a little forgotten at the moment. You know, you speak of telemed support and I'm thinking this is such a great opportunity for us to reach people that have not been able to have medication assisted treatment or not as effectively in rural areas. Is, is that along the, Am I thinking along the right lines, or, uh, or maybe see? May that be some of the bright side that comes out of this? Absolutely. Um, the ability to work um, 
um, in out you know, without the um, uh, encumbrance of the um, limitations on telemedicine for controlled substance prescribing has been um, quite beneficial to patients, right? And after all, that's why we're doing this, right? I mean, I hope we can all agree. <laughs> um, the, you know, um, even now, for instance, um, I'm collaborating with uh, Williamson County. Um, a, 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 now that we have uh, the opportunity to uh, provide um, uh, Schedule Three controlled substance opioid substitution treatment to patients via telemedium, provided appropriate uh, safeguards, um, we can we can see people in the field and uh, prescribe them uh, uh, the medication that they need. Um, Williamson County is doing a great job identifying people. We're in the midst of a of a spike in overdoses over there, so the need couldn't be greater. The healthcare system in general is um, almost fully dedicated to COVID management right now. Right. So they're they're good public health, you know, physicians over there. Don't don't have time for for these folks, right? So it's 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 a it's a great benefit to have the opportunity uh, to you know utilize the the power of, of of a virtual medium to be able to deliver care like any other health care that, that we can deliver right so i think um when when appropriate awareness and partnerships um are, are formed around this i think it can be of great benefit um, um like you mentioned you know rural delivery um you know we've we've made efforts to partner uh with uh, um, organizations that are in um, either rural or uh, uh, or um, uh, underrepresented uh, communities, there are a lot of technical challenges to doing that. Right? You, you know, you can't just um, um, set up shop and start prescribing right. uh, without a you know running afoul of uh, the DEA um, and b. Uh, without providing appropriate uh, monitoring and, and true medical care, right? Sure. Um, I think you know, as a as a as a addiction psychiatrist who prescribes you know medications, opioid substitution, both through OBOT and through uh, methadone, uh, you know OTP. Um, you know, we 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 do, and I, and again, I'm I'm completely in favor of. Mm -hmm much broader access, no question. Right. But I don't want to lose the side of the fact that this is medical care, right? right? We don't treat diabetics without appropriate monitoring and follow-up. We don't treat hypertensives without appropriate monitoring and follow-up. So although I'm a big proponent of increase of access, I don't believe that it should occur at the expense of appropriate medical monitoring. And when we talk about services for um, opioid use disorder, we're not just talking medications like buprenorphine, methadone, naltrexone. We're talking about services. We're talking about therapeutic services. We're talking about peer services. There, there are multiple nets of services that, that should be applied, Is it correct? Absolutely, and that's part of comprehensive management, you know. Um, now, if, if I had to, if, if, you know, if I had to pick, you know, well, you know, should this person at least have access to medication, barring all other? I would absolutely, you know, right. choose that option. I, I think I think the the data support it, right? That medication access in and of itself drives outcomes, right? So, uh, but obviously, you know, more has to be done. You know, this is not um, for many many people. This is a very complex disorder that requires uh, uh, different types of services, different approaches to support them. Great. Yeah, and, and you know, definitely, uh, I believe the numbers very clearly say that a medically monitored use of medication is always going to be far more safer than illicit drug use and, and uh, more dangerous activities. Um, 
when we talk about medication, we know with opioid use disorder, we have medically assisted treatment, we have detox, and we have our traditional treatment system. You have made mention of electronic stimulators. I know nothing mm -hmm. about this. Can, can mm -hmm. you give us a little bit of information around that? Absolutely. Um, and, and you know, uh, you know, full disclosure, I, I'm, I'm actively uh, participating um, as a principal investigator and consultant uh, on a, um, um, a neurostimulator device for the treatment of opioid uh, withdrawal. Um, <clears throat> the um, the um, the device is actually uh, a wearable uh, device uh, on on your ear. It actually stimulates um, specific branches of two cranial nerve uh, systems uh, that are intimately uh, related to um, um, what we call uh, endogenous opioid uh, activity, right? So endorphin uh, and other uh, activity. Um, the stimulation can be varied uh, to different amplitudes and uh, based upon the uh, um, 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 tolerability level of, of the stimulation, a person can experience uh, varying degrees of relief from acute opioid withdrawal. Um, the study we're conducting is a, uh, a, 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 an early human trial, and it is, um, um, let's see, we've, I think we've randomized 20 patients so far, and, um, you know, without, you know, without going into um, detail, um, well, I can't go into detail. <laughs> I'm sure. That's true. But, but um, what we what we know is that the science behind it is uh, is sound, and it's actually based on uh, literature um, that um, really from the 70s and 80s there was a great interest in the use of neurostimulation for uh, opioid uh, treat uh, both analgesia and for mitigation of opioid withdrawal, and um, what, what's been done um, in, in the company, I'll just say the name of the company is Spark Biomedical. They're, they're based out of Dallas. You're welcome to look them up. Okay. Um, what they've done is just applied some more advanced um, neurostimulation technology and more, more, know, more accumulated know-how uh, to um, uh, the treatment of opioid withdrawal syndrome. So we have, we're conducting a trial here locally for um, uh, adults. And then uh, very interestingly, uh, Spark also um, has launched a trial of uh, neurostimulation or uh, auricular neurostimulation for uh, the treatment of neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome as well. Okay. So if you can imagine they've, they've made these, you know, tiny little baby ear sized devices that are being deployed for the treatment of uh, neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome as well. So it's, it's very exciting. Um, um, I, you know, I, I, you know, I have an academic background, so I, I, I'm very reluctant to try to get into any kind of, you know, um, unfounded promotion. Sure, sure. Um, I, I think, though, that um, th this is a, certainly a promising uh, frontier, promising development. And, and when we think about it, opioid withdrawal syndrome, you know, does not just exist, right, in people who have chronic uh, opioid use disorder, right? We have opioid withdrawal syndrome, as I mentioned, right. neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome is a great example, but then also individuals who um, are on opioid analgesics, for instance, um, who simply have a really difficult time right. engaging in a process of, of weaning off opioids if they, you know, if basically the benefits are no longer outweighing the risks of opioid analgesia. There's a whole class of people out there who are on chronic opioid analgesia who may in fact do better off of it. Right, so I guess my question would be, are the devices intended to be used alongside medication or alone? Yeah, so the current study condition involves the use of the device uh, for uh, the, the purpose of transitioning someone off opioids. Um, that is the, uh, you know, that's gonna be the FDA uh, um, clearance and approval 
for the device. Uh, that'll be the target, right? Um, once, it's, once it's in general use, it can be used um, adjunctively, really, with, with pretty much any approach that, that a physician and patient might want to take. You know? So could it be used um, as an adjunct, uh, say, for opioid uh, substitution induction, right? Could it be used um, um, as a means of facilitating transition to opioid blockade? Could it be used as a means of helping people tolerate lower doses of opioid analgesics, right? So there, there are a lot of other areas uh, that could be explored um, once this primary indication has been um, 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 proven. Well, it's exciting, and it sounds like there's a lot of potential there. I'd like to shift gears for a moment. We're talking about the health aspects of how we have been affected by COVID-19 as a society, mm -hmm. but we're also experiencing financial um, from it. So what it makes me think of is there are, we're seeing restaurants and bars and things closing their doors permanently that cannot sustain during this. But what it reminds me of are the treatment centers that are going through a very rough time right now. And as we know, locally, we have had Austin Recovery, which has been a huge help in our area for not just men and women that struggle with substance use disorder, but for families as well, women with kids. And they've only they've been our only resource for that locally, and I just kind of wondered about your thoughts on moving forward and our, you know, to reflect on our loss of Austin recovery and and you know is this something we're going to see happen, you know, more? Of course, you know, I, I realize some of these things can't get a definitive answer, but I'm just wondering your thoughts about our loss of Austin recovery specifically. Oh God, uh, you know, you're gonna make me cry. I mean, I, I think, you know, we, we've had the pleasure of working uh, with uh, Austin Recovery now for the last couple of years, and it's been very rewarding. Um, um, the, you know, it, it, I, I made a comment about this um, um, in an interview just recently. Um, you know, we're, we're really going to see, you know, what happens when a, a linchpin organization in our in the in the commute in the fabric of, of the community's uh, safety net uh, mental health and substance use disorder treatment system is suddenly gone right so you know will there be adaptations I'm sure what will those adaptations be don't know um, um, when when we talk about you know um, you know, what, what the, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about um, the idea that, that residential treatment, for instance, or, or residential treatment as it's represented in the traditional Minnesota model is, is no longer relevant or it's a thing of the past, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I would beg to differ, um, especially in, in this particular niche, right? Because right. as, I, as I've said, Austin Recovery it was just not a, a, a residential treatment program, right? Austin Recovery, in many ways, um, uh, was a social services organi organization, right. right? Taking some of the most high-risk patients, people who are directly transitioning uh, from, from the judicial system, um, women who are in uh, CPS uh, uh, um, supervision, um, postpartum, um, opioid, you know, uh, you know, postpartum women with opioid use disorder, um, people with severe mental illness and co-occurring substance use disorder, uh, all of which um, were it not for Austin Recovery, uh, would have very few, if any, options. So um, Austin Recovery, um, over its 50-year history, right, has transitioned from being kind of the, the classic Minnesota model, you know, uh, by, you know, a uh, big book, you know, program to a dynamic 
social services organization with um, uh, a philanthropic base, with grant writing capability, with a big budget, you know, that had to be, you know, supported every year. Uh, um, um, and now that's gone. So, so the implications of that, I think, can be underestimated. The hope is that, that you know, if the community can um, band together um, and reimagine, you know, what, what, what needs there are in the community around, you know, quote unquote beds, um, um, can Austin Recovery um, reinvent, you know, its model to be able to continue to serve that population um, but perhaps in a, in, a, in a different way. And, and that conversation is going on right now, you know, so I'm, I'm hopeful that whatever comes out of this uh, will result in, um, um, you know, reimagining, you know, what, what that linchpin organization can do uh, in, in the community for the, uh, the, the underserved. I agree. You know, uh, I'm proud to say that I found a better life through Austin Recovery. And, um, you know, I think a lot of locally feel tied tied to that place in one way or another uh, around our recovery or around family members or what have you. So I, I certainly hope we can pull together and, and fill that gap because there's certainly going to be one until it is filled. Um, so I, I, I look forward to seeing what comes out of it. Like I say, I'm trying to keep my glass half full and look at the upsides as we go through all of this, but it, it certainly at the moment is a loss for um, the region around Austin. Well, Dr. Torado, I thank you so much for being on. I've got one last question for you, and that is, if you could create your own flavor of ice cream, what would that be? My very own flavor. Um, you know, um, you know, it's hard to mess with perfection. Um, I would have to say, again, I, yeah, I, I have to say that rather than inventing a new flavor, uh, having the, 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 just the joy of eating um, fresh hand cranked strawberry ice cream uh, after picking those strawberries out in the field and watching them ripen right before your eyes, um, there are few more blissful experiences than that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with what I've known. I love and to me. I love that's that. the ultimate ice cream experience. I love that. And the hand crank. You took me back to my childhood there. And mm -hmm. me, I think my mom made some great strawberry ice cream. And then every year when it was peach season. Or peach ice cream. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, but yeah, that hand crank that, yeah, you can't, you can't mess with that. Well, Dr. Torado, thank you so much. And we appreciate you. I learned so much from you every time I get a chance to talk to you. And thanks for being a guest on the show. Thanks, Phil. Anytime. Look forward to it.